delighted to talk to you today. Thank yeah. you for coming all the way sure. out here. I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. Before we get into anything, I got to know, I, you got to explain to me what's going on with this purity ring thing, melting down these purity rings and, yeah. and making yeah. a golden vagina sculpture. <laughs> it's not like, golden. Is, <laughs> just to say, it's not golden. People started freaking it? out about that. Um, why, why that part of it? Oh, because of the story where uh, people melted their jewelry into a golden calf and worshipped oh, right. it. And yes. so people are like, it's Very idolatry. Mm. Um, so I was thinking more swords into plowshares, you know, which is another Bible verse where you uh-huh. take something that was meant for harm and you um, repurpose it into something healing for the community. So, um, I mean, purity rings were this thing that was really big in what's called the purity culture where um, – girls were asked to sort of sign a a card pledging that they would not have sex before marriage. And then they'd put a ring on their finger, um, which was called a purity ring, which Mm -hmm. was this indication that she was not available to have sex with until uh, her wedding night. Uh, And this would happen to girls when they were quite young, you know, before they knew really what sex was or who they were or right. what they wanted. And the message was, and, and quite often they'd be asked to get dressed up and their dad would ma- bring them flowers and their dad would put the ring on their finger. I mean, it's creepy as fuck. Yes. They're like 11 years old. <laughs> oh do you know what God. I mean? It's not okay. Yeah. And so the message basically is that your body isn't really your own. It um, It's like sort of the property of your father and your father's religion. It's the property of the church. Uh, and then Until it it's the property, the property of your husband, right. correct? Mm-hmm. And, um, and we must maintain the purity of this. That's right. And so I was raised point. to believe that um, was told very directly that uh, you have to dress modestly because you don't want to tempt the boys. Because, and this was a direct message. Uh, Boys can't help their sexual impulses. And so once boys, you have to make sure you don't ever arouse them sexually because once they're aroused a certain point, then they can't help themselves. So purity culture equals rape culture. These Mm -hmm. these two things are Mm -hmm. deeply related. And so... Um, I just know so many women were wore these purity rings and were basically told to disconnect from their own sexuality, from their own sensuality, from any sort of erotic impulse they might have. And their sexual development was sort of absconded with uh, by religion. And then later in life, even if they reject those teachings, they have a hard time connecting to their bodies and to their own desires. And so I just thought... You know, so many women have these purity rings. Oh, I'm so sorry. So many women have these purity rings sitting around. And I was like, how do we repurpose them? What do we do with them? And so I was on stage at the Makers event last year and was talking to the group about how I had this dream. I had just finished writing Shameless, and I have this dream to get women to mail me their purity rings so we can melt them down into a sculpture of a vagina. And I saw Gloria Steinem was sitting in the front row, and uh-huh. I just said, Gloria, I, I'd like to give you the metal vagina that's made out of <laughs> melted down purity rings as like a thank you gift from us all. And she was like, I would like to have that. Yeah, that's and like so, music to her ears, yeah. right? So now I'm on the hook, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so literally day after tomorrow this sculpture has been made uh-huh. this woman who makes my jewelry uh this artist nancy anderson from right for those that are listening that's the most badass belt buckle i've ever seen <laughs> sweet bird studio and um she is she made a, little, a sculpture out of it and it's and she took some of the rings that couldn't be melted down because they were of a different metal and she pounded them into the word freedom it's beautiful wow and um we are giving it uh, at this year's Makers Conference, uh, on stage, we will be unveiling it and presenting it to Gloria Steinem. Gloria Steinem. I mean, promised. that's you can't script that. That's unbelievable. <laughs> a dream come true. This needs to become an annual award, though, right? You need to institutionalize <laughs> this, like idea. the Golden Vagina Award every year at the Makers Conference. <laughs> right? God, I'm compl- I'm totally going to pitch that idea. Yeah, all right, good. You should. <laughs> How many person, rings did you get sent? We got like 170 rings. Yeah. Uh-huh. And the notes were devastating. I mean, the notes were like, melt it down, it only brought me misery. Mm-hmm. And one, one woman sent in her wedding band that had a diamond and said, I traded in my purity ring for this ring because mm-hmm. the church told me it was God's will, and yet it just 
caused me suffering until I got divorced 18 years later. Please destroy it. I mean, it was just it's powerful. Di- it's diabolical. Well, you know. and I got a lot of blowback, actually. A lot of people were, I maybe I'm naive. I, I just had no idea people would be so upset about the vagina thing. Uh, but they're upset on different levels. So a bunch of conservatives were, were just horrified because they thought it was idolatry. Um, and then other people were horrified because even women who follow me were like, I'm sorry, but that's vile. I'm like, oh, man, how deeply have you absorbed the messages of the patriarchy that you think that female anatomy is vile? Like, it just, it was hard to even read that. And then there were the really helpful women who uh, corrected me and said, actually, I think you mean vulva vagina is the canal inside i'm like bitch i know my anatomy Uh, but i'm just saying that's considered a vaginal image you know so is that practice still going on oh yes it's not as big as it used to be there was a book written by this man named joshua harris called true love waits which actually encouraged people to not even date to not even do more than just hold hands to to be that pure and um he is on a bit of an apology tour right now, to be honest. Mm. This man, this book that he wrote um, infected an entire generation of people. And um, he was, when he penned this book, 21 wisdom-packed years old. (laughs) And when his thoughts were what influenced all of these evangelicals for an entire generation. And now he's seeing the harm that it did. And he, he, he feels badly, actually. And... But the impulse towards purity is one that we see in so many different settings because on some level, we love nothing more than to know who we're better than. And so purity and the desire for purity shows up in political ideology. It shows up in like how how paleo are you really eating, you know, or what? Like yeah, I was going to say, it, it definitely manifests itself in the health and wellness space. Oh, this idea that 100%. you're going to eat yourself to enlightenment mm-hmm. or, or mm-hmm. not eat yourself to enlightenment, yeah. um, that purification of the physical corpus mm-hmm. is, is a route to, you know, a, a greater spiritual awareness. Yeah, yeah. And well, this distinction between yeah. purity and holiness, yeah. which is something that you talk totally. a lot about. Yeah, because... Um, the difference is that holiness is about connection to like moments of holiness are about being deeply connected um, to yourself or to the moment or to the divine or to another person. To me, holiness is always about connection to and purity is always about separation from. It's like separating ourselves from our desires, but more than that, separating ourselves from the people who are impure. Uh-huh. And um, so holiness is about connection to, and purity is about separation from, but we pretend they're interchangeable because purity is just easier to regulate than holiness. Well, purity speaks to your inherent ability to control yourself, right? Like, holiness has to do with things that are out of your control. That's a good way to put it, You know too. what I mean? Like, totally. And I think for people, yeah. you know, speaking as, you know, somebody who's also in recovery like mm-hmm. yourself, um, you know, control issues are a big part of my, you know, map of character defects. So, okay. <laughs> I have a sense of, you know, what the, the emotional landscape of... of of relief that you get when you are controlling something that mm. is within your domain mm-hmm. and it gives you a sense of safety. Yeah. And so you have, I think, damaged or, or people who have survived some level of trauma and that kind of ascent to purity or that like mountain that you're climbing towards that gives people uh, a true north. Right. That they're not even aware is leading them in a direction away from that which they're truly seeking. But it's it's also um, just a way to feel like we have the ball in our own court. Exactly. And right. so um, this is why, I mean, I, the thing I've written about more than anything and spoken about more than anything in my career is the idea of grace. And um, grace is a really difficult thing for us because it means... It inherently means the ball's not in our court. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You can't earn it. It's not something that you climb toward. It's something that you get. And on some level, we think it must, if it's free, it must be worthless. And so um, I think that people 
instead of focusing on grace, like to focus on being good. And But being good has never set me free in the way that um, truth has and things that have interrupted me from outside of me. So... Well, I think good or the pursuit of being good is the thing that provokes the feelings of less than and shame and 100%. guilt and, and insecurity, <laughs> mm-hmm. whereas grace is permissive, mm-hmm. right? But okay. grace is also something that you describe as being a pain in the ass from time to time. Totally. Like it's inconvenient. Mm-hmm. For sure, especially so explain. when it's uh, – when the reason grace is tricky is because um, – I want to feel like I've made myself worthy of something. And if it's truly grace, it means it has nothing to do with worthiness. It just is. Mm. And that's hard. And then also grace sucks because if it's if it's true for me, it means it also is true for the people who've hurt me. Right. And that's, I don't that's like definitely that. definitely inconvenient. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> right. And um, right. like I'm all for it until we get to that. That's why... Um, I always say that, like, with my luck, I'll be seated at the heavenly banquet between, like, Ann Coulter and some racist cop. Yeah, right, <laughs> you know exactly. I mean? to like, test if you, you believe in grace, it's, like, right. super uncomfortable in that way because, mm-hmm. because self-righteousness is just never an option. And I love self-righteousness like I love chocolate. And so, it's intoxicating. It is. But and purity plays right into that. 100%. Because if, you, can re- if yeah. you really feel like you're more pure than your fellow person, yeah. that just you're right on your bully pulpit to be self-righteous. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, that's why it was that, that moment was so interesting when I was interviewing Lance Armstrong. I had that conversation with Lance Armstrong yeah. on stage at Nantucket because that day it was so interesting when people knew I was the one... I, uh, so I'm super. I'm I'm like obsessed with the idea of compassion right now, but not like as a virtue to adopt to be good. Fuck that. Nothing's ever worked like that for me. I'm not in, like if someone's like, oh, did you read that that really great book about compassion? I'd be like, yeah, not interested. Uh-huh. But I'm because so, I'm such a pragmatist. I'm super interested in the effect of compassion. That I'm interested in mm-hmm. because when somebody's been in a true space of compassion, right across from me, it's moved the needle. For me, in terms of considering something I hadn't considered on my own, seeing a way I might have been wrong, like it's a safe and it's a loose place to consider those things. Whereas when someone's been accusatory or challenging or calling me out, I immediately get defensive. I can't hear it, right? So I'm, I'm just obsessed with this idea of what's the effect of compassion on me or even on my body in conversations. And so... This person I know who does uh, trauma work, they work with people in trauma. I was asking them, like, how do you, how in the world do you manage to not be completely depleted all the time taking in these stories? Mm -hmm. And she had this image I just can't get over, which is, she said, I imagine the heart of God, like, right behind my heart, so that whatever that person is saying... I feel it genuinely because it comes through my heart, but it doesn't land there. It lands in the heart of God. So, and then anything that comes out of me towards them doesn't originate from my own resources and deplete me. It originates from the heart of God and just comes through me, right? Right. Obsessed that's a very, with this. Well, that's a very like <laughs> unique and specific way of uh, imagining healthy boundaries for yourself, right, right? Right. Okay. So, that day when people knew... I was the one having a conversation with Lance. They um, they said, "Hey, uh, don't let him off easy." Like people would come up to me all day and be like, "Well, when it comes to Lance, everyone's going to have an opinion or some advice." Right? Okay, but like, why? <laughs> right? So, like, I what was, is the end game? Because we love to know who we're better than. Right? We're obsessed with it. So if somebody so obviously had a fall from grace, there's the scapegoating um, instinct in the human being is almost inescapable. This is why, like when Brian Williams, uh, you know, when his career had that huge bump because he didn't actually falsify a news account, he exaggerated a personal story, which, mm-hmm. by the way, we all have done. And every single time we do it, it creates an icky feeling in us. And those icky feelings build up, and we have to do something with them. So what do we do? We wait until someone like Brian Williams comes along, and we just throw all of our icky shit that we don't want to tell anyone onto them, and then we have to kill them, right? 
It's this collective way of relieving the anxiety. And of we the think group. that's going to make us feel better. That's right. But actually, it's like empty calories. It's, it completely yeah. is. I mean, self righteousness. I always say feels good for a minute, but only in a way that peeing your pants feels warm for a right. minute. You know, then you smell bad. It's cold. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, so I'm having this conversation with Lance, and I and can I just hold on? Let me just okay. say one thing. I, yeah. I don't want to interrupt you, but like <laughs> this was my first exposure to you. <laughs> and everybody needs to know, like, you're all right. So, Nadia's going to interview Lance, and it's in the round at this very cool event called the Nantucket Project. And you're opening this is line what I'm to telling. him. Yeah, okay, okay, you are. Okay, so I won't steal it. No, no, Go no. Ahead. Okay, this is where I'm yeah. going. All right. So, just so you know, they had asked me, Nadia, would you? So I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in compassion right now. I'm only really experimenting with it. I don't want anybody to be impressed. <laughs> like, uh-huh. I'm just, I'm dabbling in compassion. Okay. So, but I'm thinking about it a lot. And they said, would you have a conversation on stage with Lance Armstrong? And I said, yeah, I totally would, right? Then they said, would you have a conversation on stage with Sean Spicer? And I said, no, fuck that guy. <laughs> Like, yeah. just to say, uh-huh. my, my ability <laughs> to be open and compassionate, yeah. fucking limited. Okay, so I, I get to that day, everyone's like, give him a hard time, blah, blah, blah. and I sit there and I have that image of compassion, of having God's heart behind mine, and, and sort of being open to this human being across from me as a person with a unique story, and that most of which none of us know. Right? Most yeah. of us don't really know this human being's full story. And and I said to him, opening thing I said was, Lance, I see from my notes that you took drugs you weren't supposed to. And then you lied about it. And then I said, Oh my god, I did that shit so many times. <laughs> it was so great. <laughs> and everyone How long laughed. did it take you to Figure that line out. It was just that day. I was like, really? "How's this going to happen?" And so it just broke the ice. Totally. And, and everybody, laughed. there was he like this so catharsis. There was a right. catharsis, not just with him, but the whole, the whole audience. Room. Who's and like then holding I looked this around. And I don't know if you yeah. remember. I said, "You raise your hand, audience, if you at any point in your life took drugs you weren't supposed to and lied about it." And people are like, "Yeah, I did that shit." You know, <laughs> they raise their hand. Yeah, but, but there's also a lot of yeah, but. Correct. I get that. I get that. And it's tricky with Lance. You know, I see the gray, and I've interviewed him for this podcast, and I got the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you weren't hard enough. You were too hard. I mean, everybody's got an opinion on this guy. And my only agenda was I want to understand this person better who's on the receiving end of, you know, a lot of criticism and a lot of celebratory pats on the back. Like, how confusing for a human being. and. How many people on planet Earth have been as high as he has gone yes. and as low? And that's, that's right. inherently fascinating Completely. and it's incredibly human to yeah. explore that. Yeah. I just, I really liked him and we had this rapport that we developed the day before and and um, just kind of, I, I really... Like, I'm like, look, dude, I know you're an atheist, but you need a pastor, you know? So, <laughs> it's just like, I'm this person's pastor on stage. Uh-huh. Um, and... Um, he had a friend there, known him for like 18 years and seen him interviewed a million times. And she's like, yeah, he, he was different, you know, yeah, because I truly was, I, I felt compassion for him. Mm-hmm. Truly, it wasn't, I didn't put it on. And um, so now I'm just interested in that, the effect that that had. But I'm also interested in like, what is it that people wanted and why? Why do they want you to be tough on him? What is the need within us to... Do, do you know what I mean? Because, yeah. like, Lance Armstrong's never done shit to me as an individual, right? I, not, he's never done anything to yeah. me. So why would I need, you know, some catharsis by hearing him say something? I feel like so. He where what say. is the seat of that in your mind? Wow, um, it's that thing of we love to know who we're better than, and in some way it keeps us from having to do our own work and look at our own stuff when we can point to somebody who's worse. Yeah. We love that. Well, you have an interesting perspective to bring it back to the purity rings with the community of women um, who propagated this you know, philosophy for mm. generations mm-hmm. when you went back and looked at your own like journals when you were a young person mm-hmm. in a very mm-hmm. conservative right. church, right? <laughs> Yeah, 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 it was interesting because 
So people who are raised in really conservative religious settings, we're, ultimately the thing it has in common is that uh, it just gives you extremely dualistic thinking. So you're raised in this uh, sort of construct of there's good or bad, you're right or wrong, you're in, you're out, you're us or them, saved or lost. And so we're seeing that more than ever right now. For sure. And so, the, but that man, when, when that's where you stay in spirituality and religion, that's the beginner course, man. That's like mm-hmm. <laughs> just developmentally, that's the beginner course. But so many people are stuck there. And so I was given that construct of like good or bad, right or wrong, and dualism. So you can take the girl out of fundamentalism, but it's much harder to take the fundamentalism out of the girl because when I left, I just replaced it with really radical leftist politics. And ideologically, it was just very similar in terms of so dualistic. Mm -hmm. There's no gray, you know? And so what I realized is the anger I had about that religious upbringing dissipated and I felt like I was free and something was sort of almost healed inside of me Mm -hmm. when I was able to look back at that religious upbringing that gave me dualistic thinking and not view the upbringing dualistically. When I was able to look back at it and admit there were things that were beautiful and saying that didn't feel like a betrayal of that little girl who was hurt, that's when I was free. In other words, transcending this either-or mentality, yeah. black or white, yeah. um, binary perspective, and moving towards both and. Totally. So when I could, These two things can be simultaneously happening. Yep. So when I could go, oh, there's subtlety here, there's good and bad in the religious upbringing that gave me dualistic thinking, that was the magic. That was right. the point. And we're so reticent to To do that, I think to to see to admit there was something good in something that hurt us, because it feels like it's a betrayal of the part of us that was hurt. Yeah, but, and to bring it to the to the purity rings and like this journal that you had, mm-hmm. it was this idea that uh, the purity movement is is so inherently regressive and mm-hmm. and awful, and we can wince at it now. Yeah. And yet, at the same time, to recognize that these women were trying to help younger women find their place within a community that yeah. wasn't really recognizing them. Totally. So, it was this Christian charm class that I, that me and the <laughs> yeah. other um, uh, 11, 12-year-old girls, 13-year-old girls went to every week. I, I assume, just by spending time with me, that the fact that I was in a, a girl's Christian charm class it fucking shows, doesn't uh-huh. it? It does. Yeah, it's still. Um, <laughs> You're still <laughs> reacting against that. No, man, I'm charming as fuck. So um, it worked. <laughs> but but so I found the old workbook, including this like how feminine are you quiz, which I uh-huh. included in my book, and um, I scored very low. And uh, and I was looking at this ridiculous workbook and. Across from the How Feminine Are You quiz was a Bible reading verse chart and a calorie counting chart. Uh I mean, this is pernicious, right? And so, but I looked back on it with this blend of sort of anger and tenderness because these women who were teaching this class is like, man, if this is the only currency, if your femininity is the only currency that you have to broker anything with in this subculture, there was something very sweet about the fact that these women were trying to help us make the best of it. Yeah. And that's the end. That's the end. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful to be able to inhabit both of those ideas, recognize them, and allow them to live, you know, in their own space amongst each other. And I think that's relevant to, you know, how you approach someone like Lance. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. how can you have compassion for him? I have mm-hmm. compassion for him. Mm-hmm. I'm not him. I don't, I don't presuppose to understand what it's like to be that person and be yeah. faced with those choices. And I think people that judge that without, you know, in ha- you know walking a mile in his shoes, so right. to speak, it's right. just, it's not fair. This is why I'm so committed to an idea within Christianity that most people really 
um, recoil from, and I understand why they do. But it actually is the idea of human sin, because I think that that word has been conflated with like immorality um, in a way that I find unhelpful. But when I use it, um, there's a guy named Francis Spufford who wrote a book called mm. Unapologetic, and I read it once a year. And he wanted to use that concept of human sin, but he knew the the term that word was problematic. And so every time in his book that that's what he meant, he substituted this, the human propensity to fuck things up. I'm right. like, okay, who's going to be like, I don't got that. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? So the fact that there is some inherent flaw in the human, which is the reason um, that uh, Simeon Zoll, a theologian says, the system keeps throwing up errors, you know, like, we all have this human propensity to fuck things up. Um, and one of the things that I've found, like I've been doing more and more speaking in like the wellness community, and for some reason I'm in that scene now, um, that w- I feel like the transformation that's offered in these subcultures is, is real, but I think will always be limited if it bypasses the darker aspects of being human, because the way in which, the, like, one of the places we do see the true transformation of the human heart is in, like, the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm-hmm. And you know what the 12 steps takes very seriously is the human propensity to fuck things right. up. It does not bypass that part no, of us. It, it, not only does it recognize it, it embraces it yeah. completely and without judgment. I mean, that's fundamental to the whole It's your. It's program. the basis of belonging <laughs> to, to that community. Yeah, and so your, your particular breed of, of, Luth, of Lutheranism is to accept sin as part and parcel of the human condition, but you're really kind of reclaiming what that means and translating it in a way that's different from perhaps our conventional notions of what it is to be a sinner or to sin. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, in Latin, I have tattooed on my wrist, simul justa set peccator, which means simultaneously sinner and saint. We're all 100% of both all uh-huh. the time. Nobody's like 80-20. So, it sort of deflates these really lofty notions of purity, in a sense, to go, we're always going to be a mix of these two things. Mm-hmm. And so, what that helps do is that you're actually never surprised. Do you know what I mean? You, right. You're not going to be surprised if a human being does something awful, and you're not going to be surprised if a human being does something beautiful. Right. Right? I will never be an idealist. I couldn't possibly be an idealist about any human project, um, but I'm really idealistic about God's ability to redeem the human propensity to fuck things up. Like, Uh we can be the people who fuck things up and something beautiful can still happen out of it. I'm like, whoa, like that's the, these are the moments of faith that I have. But you could be idealistic about holding space for somebody to step into, you know, a better, more fully expressed version of themselves, right? I mean, that's kind of what what, what, what you're doing with the church like, there's some Christian tra- traditions that believe in, like, Christian perfection and, like, progressive sanctification. Uh-huh. I could never buy into it, ever, ever, ever. But I think we do we do get the opportunity to grow in wisdom. Yeah. I think we can increase the wisdom we have in the world, and it does not decrease the fact that we have the propensity to fuck things up. That doesn't we go We certainly away. have that. And <laughs> <laughs> It's exactly like AA, like you learn in the rooms to not judge somebody who comes back from a relapse. It's like, well, of course he drank. We're, you know, we're alcoholics. Like, that's what we do. The miracle is that we didn't do it today. Exactly. And it's cool. Come on back. And and you learn empathy and you learn to reserve judgment. And it's given me just this expansive capacity to love humanity in totally. all its forms, yeah. right? And without judgment. And I see that reflected in your congregation. Yeah. I know you're, you've, you've recently moved away from that, but you know, over the last however many years that you yeah, were ten years. You know, there, like that's the closest thing I've ever seen to AA. Yeah. To, oh, 100%. Yeah. That was on purpose. Because look, people are so much more frequently speaking honestly like honestly about their lives uh-huh. and connecting to God and to one another in church basements than in church sanctuaries. Yeah, yeah. You know? I saw you read that. It, it is so, I never really thought about that. I was like, wow, the honesty that's going on in the basement is incredible. It's such a beautiful thing that this movement has created yeah. Yeah. Um, to, yeah. to help people heal. Yeah. And then upstairs right. on Sunday, 
there's so much bullshit. Yeah, it's the human competition extravaganza once mm-hmm. again, you know? So I, yeah, I think that I, like people have asked, how has being part of a 12 step community influenced you as a pastor and as a theologian? And I'm like, it's impossible to answer that because I was 22 when I started showing up to church basements Mm -hmm. and I'll be 50 in April. So literally my brain hadn't even finished developing yet. Right. And so I learned how to be a, what it meant to be a human being and a fucking grown up in those rooms mm-hmm. and what spirituality looked like and what honestly honesty looked like so it there's no way for me to tease it apart what was that yeah. and what was something else and what about organizationally i mean when you look at the movement the 12 step <laughs> movement yeah. and how it's continued to grow and and expand and you know maintain like a level of integrity with its roots mm. in a world in which institutions particularly the church is you know falling on the sword of its own inherent flawed humanity that runs it yeah there's something to be gleaned from that uh, oh totally totally i mean i know what we tried with uh, uh, house for all sinners and saints is that um for instance, we we were we said, look, we're anti excellence, pro participation. That is such a counterintuitive thought uh-huh. when it comes to organizations. I got to the point where I wouldn't accept speaking invitations from any organization that had the word excellence in its title. <laughs> So the so what what, what that, if they said they were against excellence? Yeah, if they were anti excellence, yeah, okay. Then you would go. So, like we didn't, we never had a five year plan, we never had a vision statement, we never had a mission statement. Um, we were anti excellence, pro part, like all of the things that these institutions of churches think will save them. We said no thanks. Mm. All the things that the church consultants are telling churches they should do and focus on, we said, that's not true. <laughs> and and subsequently, you'd be hard-pressed to find a Lutheran congregation in the United States of America that has more young adults in it. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting <clears throat> is that you did it within the construct of, of the organization. You didn't just rent a space and say, okay, I'm my own church. You're doing it within the construct of the Lutheran church. Yeah, and they totally at some point you convince them to be <laughs> permissive enough to let you do it in this non traditional yeah, way. Yeah, but you know why? Because being a Lutheran is a, is is foundationally just a theological identity. What is Lutheranism? Well, it's like, um, <clears throat> you know, in, in fifteen seventeen, this Augustinian monk, you know, nailed ninety five theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church and was like, "Here are ninety five things that I think we're fucking up in with uh-huh. the church, and we need to stop." as a way of trying an invitation to a conversation. And that sparked the Protestant Reformation. And ultimately, he was a pastor, and he, he saw how the teachings of the church were harming the people in his care, and he was more loyal to the people than he was to the teachings of the church, which is what I'm trying to do in that book. Mm-hmm. But, um, but Lutheranism is, um, is very different than other Christian systematic theologies and the fact that the focus is grace. It's mm-hmm. not on being good. It's not on these lofty ideals of um, progressive sanctification. It's it's closer, honestly, to the twelve step stuff, where it's mm-hmm. like, oh yeah, you can't do this, and but God can do for you what you can't do for yourself, mm-hmm. and it is the closest Christian theology to that notion, which is why I was drawn to it because I'd been sober for some time by the time I was introduced to Lutheran theology, right. and. It, it gave me language for what I'd already experienced to be true. And so, since Lutheranism, being Lutheran is a theological identity, I'm a very orthodox Lutheran theologian, technically. And so, because the denomination trusted me as a theologian, they, they have never questioned me as a practitioner. There's something super punk rock about that. It's almost more punk rock to say, I'm going to do this within the organization than it is to like trash the organization and do your own thing, because that would be a lot easier. It's much right? more subversive. So, it's very convenient for somebody to look at you and go, oh, all the tattoos and the potty mouth, and <clears throat> you know, it's, you strike a very unique pose, and it allows people to project a whole sensibility yeah. no, onto but you, you know right? what I- And it's more, it's more complicated than that, because you're this social progressive, but you're also very much a, theolo- a theological uh, traditionalist totally. in many ways. Totally, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so it's like but, a conundrum. But you know what I've it's been confusing. saying recently in interviews is like, the, in so many ways, I'm not the story because the tattooed, foul mouthed lady pastor story is interesting for five minutes. And that five minutes gets ended you in the door, though. Years ago. Yeah, yeah, it does. But the real story is what shifted culturally in America that's created a situation under which I'm who people want to listen to when it comes to religion? That's the question. That's so, the story. So, in your opinion, how do you answer that question? What did shift? Um, authority. I think what authority looks like has completely changed, and um, in a way that a lot of institutions right. Just make sure you're talking oh, about sorry, a little bit. that a lot of institutions haven't paid attention to that shift. And um, I think for a long time we wanted leaders to be on a pedestal and to be the sort of example of holy living or whatever. And yet, there's a way that all of the institutions that we have experienced have sort of disappointed us because every time we've looked behind the curtain we've not actually found the wizard of oz we found scared little men and women pulling levers mm-hmm. trying pretending to be big right yeah well it's a <laughs> it's an abuse of trust and a level of duplicity right. that just leads people further and further away yeah but the reason we had institutions to begin with has to do with the enlightenment really i mean because in it like in 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 the past, whatever had authority was whatever our grandparents and great-grandparents had experienced and trusted to be true, that's where authority was for us. You didn't question it. And the reason is because things weren't shifting very quickly, mm-hmm. culturally, right? You could, you could trust it. Well, things shifted very quickly, like during the Enlightenment. And suddenly, we have this like elevation of human reason, and everything sort of shifted, and so what happened, and, and we got things like penicillin and stuff like that. But now we have institutions that were developed in order to hand over the goods that the Enlightenment promised us, right? And so now you don't trust anything in the past. You can only trust things that are sort of new and inventive. So what this is where we have banking, we have universities, we have hospitals, we have denominations. So all of these institutions were established after the Enlightenment to deliver on the goods, the promises Mm -hmm. of the Enlightenment. But then what happened is we end up with like the Vietnam War and Watergate and clergy sex scandals. And that's where we pull the curtain back and we go, oh, these institutions became more concerned with perpetuating themselves and protecting themselves than they were with delivering the thing they said they were about. Right. And Because they're run by humans. Yeah, totally. That's the biggest <laughs> right. problem, right? Right, right, right. So, I think we're in this weird time right now where human, where, it, you know, I, I, Esther Perel will say, like, so many big decisions were always decided for us before now, you know, that we... We weren't, there weren't all of these options on the table. And that now so much weight is weight, weighs on the individual to make big, big decisions that it used to be that either institutions or your culture or your religion was deciding for you. And that's a first in human history. Yeah, I think it's a very recent development, too. Extremely recent. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've heard you talk about like kids growing up with, you know, choose your own adventure yeah, stories. Yeah. Like they have to they have to imagine the you know, the endings of their own stories now. And everything is super personalized to meet your own unique agenda. And mm-hmm. I think there's a there's a downside to that. Um, and I think it plays out in um, in ideas around faith, with I, which I know mm-hmm. you talk about. Mm-hmm. But also in in kind of snowflake culture too. Mm-hmm. You know, like everybody's sure super precious and i think that tends to alienate us as much as it does unify us Um, but like affirming my specialness in every variety is the only way that you're allowed to relate to me and for me to approve of you know right intense right and (laughs) and you see it with you know you've had tattoos for a long time but like tattooing is a way of distinguishing yourself and if you kind of you know explore that with somebody like hey tell me about this then it's almost like offensive so it's like you can't really win in that conversation yeah right right yeah yeah i think the weight the weight of all of these choices of self-expression and uh um can actually kind of create a lot of anxiety how do i know i'm choosing right or have i weighed all the options or 
You know, I mean, things we never even had to decide before. So, are you there, saying that we 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 inherently want to be ruled? Well, I think, by a benevolent dictator. I think I think that we need load bearing structures. Uh huh. You know, um, and that's what religion. It, it's. <laughs> This is the first time we've had cultures that weren't religious, like in human history. Mm. So there was a way in which religion was a load-bearing structure in terms of understanding who we were, um, understanding morality, um, having a, a symbol system for for uh, imaging the divine, for marking the year together. Um, there's a function that that religion has played in in throughout human history that I feel like even though the institutions of religion have hurt a lot of people, I just think it's just not time to dispense with that idea entirely. And it's a really recent idea in human history that you can just choose your own symbol system. That's, that's new. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, the foundations of, of religion are, are crumbled, you know, and mm-hmm. there's, a, there's a, uh, you know, a crisis of trust um, in those structures and those institutions. Which I think is why people are like, well, I feel like I can... I I like to listen to Nadia. Well, it, I think it's just because I I really do try to be very forthcoming with my shortcomings and with things I've gotten wrong or shit I don't know. You know, there's not the curtain so much. Yeah. There's nothing you're going to like find out that's going to like right. like at one point I was but like That's also like something that you learn in in AA, right? Totally. To like own those flaws yeah. and, and and you know, find the empowerment and the vulnerability. And to not actually have shame about it. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is like I believe in the power of grace so strongly that I have no shame in admitting why I need it. Mm -hmm. So then people feel like they can trust what I'm saying. Also, like, self-incrimination is, like, my go-to rhetorical move, and that allows me to be more hearable to people because I'm not standing above them. You can connect with you. And Listen, I've heard you speak. It's very, you know... It's not just it's 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 a it's an incredible experience to hear you speak, and I can feel myself connected to the message that you're putting out there, and it makes me reflect back on my experience as a young person going to church, mm-hmm. and just sitting in these pews thinking, "What am I doing here? I can't relate to any of this. I don't understand <laughs> what the they're point? talking about. I'm falling asleep. Why is that guy swinging that rope with the terrible smelling oh, stuff? And he's dressed up. No, I, oh, like I went to an Episcopalian, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. elementary school. I just found the whole thing totally bizarre, and I was like confused about what I was supposed to get out of it. It yeah. wasn't that I had. It wasn't that I was traumatized by it. Right, I just right, didn't right. understand it, and I didn't understand why everyone felt compelled to go. Like I was but getting nothing re- out of it. Have this. you reverted to any of it in times of crisis at all? Not in a in a in an organizational structured no, kind but I of mean way. personally. Yeah, in a, in a in a non-denominational kind yeah, of yeah. Um, yeah. spiritual way. Yeah, you know, I found God in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, yeah. and my spiritual growth has has you know taken me through you know an exploration of many different types of faith and yeah. and experiences and practices and teachers mm-hmm. and the like. And mm-hmm. I haven't settled into one particular mm-hmm. perspective on that, but yeah. I've learned from all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing that Esther said, and I'm just quoting like smarter women than myself, but she, um, she said that that it's easy that the th- one of the things that religion offers is that in times of uh, of crisis and of pain, when we're collapsing, there's something to hold us. Like like it's easy to come up with uh, rituals and practices and stuff in times of birth or weddings. But when shit hits the fan, um, there's something there to hold you, that there are these sort of rituals or prayers that have been worn smooth by generations of the faithful um, in a way that can kind of bring us comfort when you can't just create your own thing on the spot when mm-hmm. you're in a position of uh, crisis and pain. I thought but that was can beautiful. that be? Can can you have that connection without the baggage that comes with the institution? <laughs> that's the question. Yeah, right. No, that's literally the question right now. I mean, I when I left Christianity for a decade, I couldn't have anything to do with it. I was, you know, after I left the church I was raised in. So when people say like, "Look, a lot of us have to leave for for reasons of self preservation," like I get that. Yeah. I, I I never judge it. But I think that there is a path to integrating um, our 
religious upbringings rather than rejecting um, uh, that eventually there's that kind of work that can be done too. Even if it's just, um, you know, there's this prayer my grandmother said when I was going to sleep every night, that's still really meaningful. And I'm, I'm going to integrate that into my life, you know, that, that, that's a part of wellness to me to be able to do that. So um, I've been just sort of inviting people into considering what that might look like. And it doesn't have to be a betrayal of the part of you that needed to reject it for mm-hmm. good reason to say, yeah, but it's still formed who I am on some level. And I want to make friends with that part of me. Yeah. You know? Well, there is something timeless um, about these stories in the Bible and the truths that are, you know, laid within them. And that's something that Rob Bell has helped me a lot with, you know, in his effort to kind of reclaim this art form that is the sermon yeah. and to really get into, you know, the history behind, the history and the nuance behind these stories and mm-hmm. trying to divine, you know, the truths that are, that, are, that are buried within them. And there's something incredibly beautiful about that. Totally. But I found that I can enjoy that and explore that without having to go to a certain location on yeah. a certain day of the sure, week. Sure, sure. You know? Yeah, yeah. I love the Bible. I'm, I mean, I, I love the text so much. And um, it's like this endless, endless reservoir of meaning. And every time I've just dove in and done the work and tried to find what it's saying right now, today to me or to this community it's always given it's always handed over the goods you know Mm -hmm. and so this idea that it has this one meaning for all time that some old white man decided generations ago is insane like if you think it's a i think it's like a living tradition and so um you're gonna see something in the text today that you hopefully didn't see yesterday because you've lived one more day. So I feel like it always has something to offer about human folly, about the nature of the divine, whatever it is. Like, I love the biblical text. I'm interested in how you found your way back. But I think in order to to really understand that, we need to like understand, (laughs) we need to go to the beginning a little bit here. So you grew up in the Church of Christ, yes. that's what it was called. Mm-hmm. So that's a very, from what I understand, a very intense. Yeah, it's like Baptist church. plus, right? <laughs> and your parents were were um, pretty hardcore in this tradition. Yeah, as well. I mean, it was just our whole lives. You yeah. know, I went to church three times a week for sixteen wow. years. Yeah. yeah, and people came. And over what to our was your house experience and... as a young person going to church three times a week? That's well, you know, the thing about anybody's childhood is you don't know it's weird until you uh-huh. <laughs> meet other people and hear their stories and you're like, oh, my, mine's weird then, you know? So I didn't know it was weird. I mean, and there was beautiful things about it. There's something to be said about being raised in a community. And we did sort of um, carry each other through difficult times and celebrate in joyful times together. And um, and I was just, I'm, I was so used to gather, like you said, showing up in a location every week with the same people doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. I was so marked by that, that on some level, I've tried to recreate a healthy version of it my whole life. Right. So then what leads you, I, I was going to use the word astray. I don't know if that's the right word, but like you start... <laughs> exploring drugs and alcohol at some point like what yeah. happened okay so what happened was that i was really sick as a kid so um i had an autoimmune disorder and it one of the one of the things that happened is it caused fatty tissue to build up behind the bones in my face so um my eyeballs themselves were pushed forward out of my head so they um bulged really far out of my face Mm. to where my eyelids couldn't close and you could see a lot of white around the entire iris so they looked like they were falling out of my it was very weird looking and um so i had that eye disease from ages 12 to 16 because they couldn't do all the surgeries to correct it until the bones in my face stopped growing so it's like the worst (laughs) years for a young girl yeah because a lot of people when they're in middle school they think they look like an insect Uh i literally did and so um I think I, I've just always thought like one of two things can happen if you have that experience. You can either maybe become like a diminished person who tries to disappear, or alternately, you can go, oh, yeah, 
fuck you. Uh-huh. Right? And that's what I did. So I had this anger about how I was treated um, that I'm really grateful for because it that anger preserved something. It did protect something mm-hmm. in me that, that, that remained unharmed. Uh, but it ends up, if you mix a lot of drugs and alcohol with, with anger. that anger, yeah. it's not the best combination. Yeah. So, um, you know, I started using, I think when I was 15, and then left the church when I was 16. And, um, yeah, just it ends up like I had that thing where you just don't have the off switch, you know. Mm-hmm. Was it drugs, alcohol, everything? Was, like, what was I, the well, drug I of did, choice? I did a lot of drugs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I did a lot of coke and, you know, a bunch of other stuff. But um, it never... It never kicked my ass the way alcohol did. So for mm-hmm. whatever reason, alcohol was the thing that if I had one, the switch went off and I could not, I couldn't stop. So um, that's ultimately the thing that was the hardest for me. Yeah, but you got sober so young. I did get sober young. Yeah. Uh-huh. Was there a was there a, an intense <clears throat> bottom there? Like what brought you into the rooms at such a young age? Well, I mean, there were some physical things, just like I had sores on my hands that wouldn't heal and you know there were like there were um i wasn't well and um i didn't have money to go to treatment and i'd been i was estranged from my parents because i was such a fuck up and um so i had to kind of white knuckle it and uh the first time i sat in a meeting i heard there there was a blustery quality to my alcoholism like to me i was like Look at how good I am at being a sloppy drunk. Like mm-hmm. there was a bravado to it, right? And I mean, and, that's part of the disease, like romanticizing, yeah, fetishizing, totally. You know. And then just surrounding yourself by other people who are just as bad, so you don't have to notice that you're not doing so well. Right. <laughs> so, um, but when I sat in a meeting and I heard the honesty spoken about what that really feels like, what it's actually like to live that life, uh, I start crying. <laughs> Like, they were speaking the truth about Mm it. And um, I didn't, it took a while. Like, I didn't, I didn't, I just thought I could kind of get my shit together and go back out there. And I thought, you know, AA would help me maybe figure out how to not be out of control as much. Right. And, but I wasn't sure I belonged there. You know, it was one of those things. And so I, it was this, there was just this one day and I was at a women's meeting and I was maybe, maybe five days sober and really shaky. I mean, I, um, like I couldn't stop bouncing my foot on, you know, it Uh was, I, I was shaking and my nerves were jangled and everything, my skin felt like the rough side of Velcro. And, um, and there was this noise from the floor below, like someone had dropped a pan, and I jumped out of my seat, but like no one else moved. Uh-huh. <laughs> and this woman was sharing, and this is when you could smoke in AA meetings, and she's in the middle of sharing. And, and uh, I jump out of my seat, no one else moves, and like immediately she turned to me and she went, that'll pass. <laughs> so anyway, about prayer, I was saying, you know, like, and there was something about how immediate she said that, that I went, Oh shit, she know she's she know, felt like this. Right, she knows exactly what's going on. With there was you. no judgment. Uh-huh. There was just recognition. And I thought that combination of no judgment but recognition and just naming it, I just went, "Oh shit, I I am in the right place." You know. And um and those like suburban housewives saved my ass, mm-hmm. you know. So, and that yeah. seems like that's that that ideology kind of informs how you deal with your congregation, right? Like recognition without judgment. Yeah, I guess I hadn't thought mm-hmm. of it like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And state, you've stayed sober ever since. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, 27 years. That's or amazing. 28, no, 27. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So then you, what, well, you're like working in restaurants and you're doing stand-up comedy and yeah. <laughs> there's, no, there's not a lot of church happening at that point. No, not right? at all. I was actually really involved in like exploring sort of more goddess stuff and like women's spirituality because it was there was such an intense patriarchal male dominated thing in the church of christ like i i honestly did not hear a woman pray out loud in a church till i was 27 like you couldn't women couldn't even be ushers in the church that i was raised in so there was i had to bask in like the female image of god for a long time 
to heal something inside me before I could go back to my own symbol system. And what pulled you back in? Um, well, I met my, my now ex-husband, and um, I'd never heard of Lutherans, except for, I guess, maybe Garrison Keillor. Like, I had never, uh-huh. <laughs> I didn't know what a Lutheran was. And um, and he was, like, really involved in, like, Christian social justice, and I was like, the fuck is that? <laughs> like, what? Uh-huh. That's a thing? <laughs> like, it just seemed, I'd never heard those two things go together. And so he sort of introduced me to more progressive form of Christianity, and I was just I was just fascinated that that even existed. And, uh, you know, we moved out to California, and I very begrudgingly started going to this uh, Lutheran church that had this gay pastor and going to this adult confirmation class at night, and just I just soaked it up. I, I had no idea that you could believe those things. I, I, I none. So it was like the thing I still loved, which was Jesus, plus stuff that seemed just real and genuine and like easy to believe because I knew already knew it was true. Uh-huh. Like when they said we're simultaneously sinner and saint, I'm like, fuck, man, that that explains a lot. <laughs> That's super helpful. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then what? What compels you to go to divinity school and well, become a pastor? Um, it's, there were two two things. The, the first time I had that hit of, um, oh, I think I have, like, quote, a calling, was uh, when my friend PJ uh, committed suicide, and he was a, a comic and also in recovery, and I had not been to div- divinity school or seminary at this point, but when PJ died, our friends just turned to me and were like, well, you could do the funeral, right? And just literally because I was the only religious person right. in my friend group, uh-huh. the, the only thing that qualified me. And I said, oh, okay. And it it was like this, it was at the Comedy Works in downtown Denver, and it was packed, and I was giving his eulogy. And I just looked out, and there were all these like academics and comics and queers and recovering alcoholics. And I just thought, oh, man, these these people do not have a pastor. And then I went, oh, shit. <laughs> gonna have to be you oh damn you know so that was my first hit about that like trying and there was a sense of of being called yeah i I felt called to be a pastor to my people not to fit in some box that the institutional church has for if that's a job you want Uh you know what i mean those are two different things right like you could minister to these people in a way that that no one else that you knew could yeah yeah so that meant i had to Start a church from scratch. I, there was not one that existed yeah. that I would want because and the Lutherans I, let you. They did. Well, I looked around Lutheran churches, super nice people, but like nobody looked like me. Like, my friends aren't hanging out there. Right. I have to culturally commute from who I am to who the church is, and I just thought, oh, that's exhausting. I can't. So paint the picture of the Church of All Sinners and Saints. <laughs> um, well, it is really like you said that weird combination that I'm like this you know, kind of punk rock girl, but also theologically orthodox, but liberal, but, you know, this mm-hmm. weird, the same with the that church, because it's really liturgical, so we use this traditional liturgy, so it's traditional, but it's not conventional. Right. And so, um, we're in the round, and uh, all of the jobs are shared, except for the preaching, like, just different people do it. We, when you walk in, you're asked, do you want to lead part of the liturgy, right? You could read the gospel or serve communion or do whatever. Just by walking in off the street, we're like, hey, guess what? We trust you with the holy things, uh-huh. <laughs> just because you walked in the door. And and there's so many different kinds of people. It's super queer. Probably a third of the conversa- congregation is queer. My dad describes it as like a high church at the Star Wars cantina. Uh-huh. <laughs> it feels like. Right. (laughs) And it's totally a cappella. So we didn't ever want anything to feel like a performance. And so we're in the round and it's in its a cappella four part harmony. Like it's like sitting in the middle of a two hundred person choir. Yeah. That's wild. So all the music comes out of the bodies of the people who came. Like that to me, that's just so profound. Right. There's a pure, there's a, I was going to say purity, but that's probably <laughs> the wrong word. There's a, there's an honesty or an, or, uh, uh, something elemental about that. Totally. Right? It's beautiful. Yeah. And, and you said something that I thought was really interesting. You said that 
you need to be deeply rooted in tradition to disrupt with integrity. To innovate, yeah. Yeah, to innovate yeah, yeah, yeah. with integrity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's this, yeah. this weird combination of respecting these traditions mm-hmm. in the same way in AA. It's like, well, there's the 12 traditions. That's like, right. like, there's all kinds of insanity happening sure, you know, at sure. a big AA meeting, but right. there's this reverence and respect for right. the traditions, right. right? But every group is autonomous, and so they're all different. Like, every AA group decides what are the rules, yeah. what, you know, how's the format going to be, what's the vibe, do, you know, so there's all that freedom. But the, the reason there's so much freedom is there's that load-bearing structure that's holding it together uh-huh. of tradition. And the face of that load-bearing structure is you. Mm-hmm. And if you're wearing the collar, mm-hmm. you you don't always do that. Though. I do. But you yeah. do. You do always. Well, not every day. So, but if I'm in, if I'm leading liturgy, like literally Sunday, I preached at the Episcopal Cathedral in Portland, and uh-huh. yeah, I had the collar, I had a stole, I had a alb, the whole shebang. And there's a there's a power and a symbolism and a tradition that's built into that. Mm-hmm. But there's also you have to admit like a separation that occurs as soon as you adorn that. Mm-hmm. There is that. Mm-hmm. Oh wait, is this person more pious mm-hmm. than I? Does this mm-hmm. person know more than sure. I? This person is in control, mm-hmm. and what they say matters more than what sure. I think. And sure, do. sure, sure. Yeah, until you hear me preach, and then you're uh-huh. like, oh no, she's really pretty much <laughs> just like she's just yeah. as bad. Like I am never the best Christian in the room <laughs> ever, <laughs> but. Yeah, but at the same time, I liked it. I liked wearing the collar because it, the collar represents the office that I'm holding. And so, in a way, all of my foibles um, don't have to be the last word because I'm just holding an office on behalf of the people. And they're allowing me to hold that office and they want me to hold that office and to be set apart to do something really specific on behalf of everyone. Mm -hmm. And um, in that way, it really worked. Right. Mm -hmm. You tell this funny story about what happened when the church, the church just started out, it was like your friends in your living room, and then it was like 40 people or 50 people. Mm -hmm. But then you got some press in Denver, and then the the bridge and tunnel crowd started (laughs) to show up, right? right. And you're like... It was the front page of the Denver Post, and when it came out, I was texting people like, hey, uh, where do you buy a paper? You know, everyone's uh, like, I think 7-Eleven. I don't know. Like, nobody in my congregation took the paper. But you know who takes the paper? 60-year-olds from the suburbs. Uh-huh. And that's who caused my congregation to double in size overnight. Yeah. So, suddenly, soccer moms and dads yeah. and dockers show up to, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. you know, take a peek at what's going on. Yeah. And that's, was- that, that's a challenge to... Your sense of your your ability to eman- to to emanate grace, right? Like this is challenging your idea of what you thought and wanted this it was, organization it was to look ter- like. It was horrible because right. I just thought you could show up to any mainline Protestant church in the city and see a room full of people who look just like you. Like you're messing up our cool, man. Like you know, <laughs> it was horrible, and and then. I called a friend and I was like, dude, have you, who had a similar congregation, I was like, have you ever had normal people mess up your church? <laughs> yeah. And we always had this thing about like, we, of welcoming the stranger is part of our values. And so. Right. And we always think of welcoming the stranger as thinking, thinking that stranger is the one who's ostracized. But what if that stranger <laughs> is the person who's the mainstream? Totally. Person. Totally. He's like, well, you guys are great at that if it's like a transgender kid. Mm-hmm. But sometimes the stranger looks like your mom and dad. I was like, well, fuck you. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then, so what happened was we had this meeting because we were going like, I was like, we got to we gotta do something. And, um, but I had that phone call and it felt like this divine heart transplant, you know, again. And I told the group, like, hey, my, I called my friend and he said this. Because I thought what the meeting would be would be all the people who were there originally would say who they are and why the church is important. And then the people for whom it wasn't really for them would, like, self-select out. Like, this is uh-huh. my evil plan. 
And then, but then I told on myself at the beginning of the meeting that I had that phone call. And then Asher was like, well, as the young transgender kid who was welcomed into this community, I just need to go on record as saying, I'm really glad there are people who look like my mom and dad here because they love me in a way my mom and dad can't right now. And I was like, yeah. oh, fuck, meeting over. So like, the kid that's drops that's like the <laughs> spiritual truth bomb. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, like, All right, I'll see you guys Sunday. <laughs> uh-huh. But now the part of that story that people don't know is that the the very people I had a hard time welcoming um, just a, a year later even so for years now I cannot imagine it being house for all sinners and saints without them that I, it's impossible for me to imagine the church without them we're not us without them and um, I think that was chapter 14 or something in uh, the book Pastrix, and there's this couple that are that fit that description who show up and they're just the ultra, they're the just the, the best volunteers. They do so much work. They serve all the time. They're incredible. And the first time they showed up to help do all this cooking for Operation Turkey Sandwich, they put they had T-shirts made that just say Chapter 14 on them uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> as a way of harassing me. Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> and it makes it even weirder that you have the that that the crowd is diverse in that way. Oh yeah, because you walk in, and you're that, like, I'm, I'm unclear what all these people yeah, have in common, <laughs> right? And that brings it back to the similarities with AA, right? Yeah, because it's like for that's sure. the only place I've ever been where you see this intersection of the most unlikely um, community of people to intersect with each other. Yeah, they shouldn't in mix. a meaningful way. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now also, it's interesting because. There's such a culture of turn-taking in that community that even the people who on the surface seem like the broken ones, you know, um, we don't have the designated broken people in the community. That I have seen the people who have maybe some more complicated lives um, in in a heartbeat turn and be of service to the really stable people in a way that only they can. But don't we take turns at being the broken one? Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... In a healthy way, we do. If it's a healthy ecosystem of a community, that's what should be mm-hmm. happening. So, you founded this church, and you grew it to prominence, and recently you decided to move on. Yeah, yeah. So, why, why, why is that? Well, because um, it was real. I started talking about my departure the first year of the church. So, it was super important to me as the founder to not for that church to not have founder syndrome. So it was something I had my eye on and I spoke out loud about from the beginning. And so it was just important to me to leave at the right time. And the fact that I was able to leave while they still loved me, uh, you know, it's like better to leave a month too early than Mm -hmm. one day too late type of thing. It's part of that because of the ego identification that takes place. Like, Oh, I'm the cult leader here. Yeah. Part of it. But, um, it was because I loved it, because I loved that church, and I wanted what was best for it. And I couldn't, I couldn't stay for the wrong reasons, uh-huh. you know? And so what happened was the, uh, the person who took over for me, we worked side by side for three years. So the last three years of the, that I was at the church, I was part-time. And, and uh, Reagan Umber, a gay Episcopal priest, was full-time. So it was a slow transition. Right. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. And now you're touring around, talking at fancy conferences, <laughs> it's so weird. giving uh, <laughs> golden vaginas. I know. You know? And, or like, the, the, this is the third year I spoke at the Nantucket Project, and this uh-huh. year they were just like, you know, would you just like, would you preach a sermon this year? Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm like, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> It was just, it was right. all like limousine liberals and atheist Jews. You uh-huh. know? <laughs> and I was like, I preached the hell out of a sermon. So it's been, it's really fun being a public theologian and just being invited into spaces. Right. You get to, you get to just travel to all these different venues and do what yeah. you do as opposed yeah, yeah. to being right. confined to a certain space. But, but I ask myself the same question. Um, if I'm speaking at Makers or Nantucket or a wellness conference, as if I'm, or if, like, you know, a year and a half ago, I led a day retreat for all of the bishops in the Church of England, right? So, all of them. I ask myself the exact same question, no matter who I'm in front of, and it's, what's, what is the most pastoral thing 
I can say to this group of people? Like, I have to dig into this, like, what is the thing that's hard in their lives? What is unspoken? What is something that is, that is, that what's a hurt that this community might share? What is a struggle? How can I speak honestly enough about that to bring some kind of hope from outside of them into the space? Like, I ask myself the same question no matter who I'm speaking to is mm-hmm. how can I be their pastor even if it's for 10 minutes? And how much planning and regardless do you go of what they into believe? it? Do you get up and, and, you know, channel the vibe, or no, do you never. you plan this whole thing out, right? Never. Yeah. Channeling the vibe is um, not going to be good for anyone. No, it's lazy. <laughs> I well, I I I I speak from a manuscript. I mean, now we're just chatting, but I speak from a, a manuscript, uh-huh. um, and like my sermons are fifteen hundred words, and I it like when I was preaching, you know, every other week at house, it would take about. 15 to 20 hours of work to write a 1500 word wow. sermon. Wow. Mm-hmm. Which is like what 10 or 15 minutes. 10. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. wow. Yeah. But um but when I was a comic I learned economy of language. I uh-huh. mean that's the th- one thing you might not know about that community of comics is that the highest compliment within that community is to say, "Hey, have you seen so and so's act?" and they go, "No." He goes, oh, "Are they good?" "Yeah. They're a really good writer." Uh-huh. So how they use language is the specificity is the mark. of it. Correct. Right. And you don't know that a stand up act is written in a sense, maybe not words on a paper. Well, when it's well done, it looks like it just occurred it flows to the person out. in the moment. But, oh no. They know every yeah, pause between a, a word, they use a very specific word. If they used one extra word in a bit, it wouldn't be as funny. So I, I don't know how anyone manages to be a preacher without being a comic first. Mm-hmm. But the comics get to get get up in front of crowds and work out their material over time. You don't have that <laughs> that opportunity. No, they aren't writing you know. a new ten minutes every yeah, week. You know, right. Ooh, brutal. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about the book. Mm-hmm. Why sex? <laughs> I mean, there's an obvious answer to that, of course. Yeah. But why invest this amount of time and intention into writing a book? <clears throat> calling for this reformation on how we think about sex? Uh, it's like a really vulnerable answer. Yeah. I've been doing it on the stage during the tour, but every time I'm like, oh. So, <clears throat> I, so I'm ordained in one of the most liberal denominations in the country, but I had to sign a document that said when I was ordained, I would be, cel- I would be faithful in marriage or celibate in singleness. And or what? I, well, that was just, or you can be brought up on charges, to be honest. And so, um, it's not even our theology. It's like we borrowed it from the Baptist. I'm like, can we give it back to the Baptist? So, I didn't think about it. I was married at the time. And I was married for almost 19 years to a, a really a really good, good man who I, I genuinely couldn't say something bad about. Um, but we never connected. Like, it just never happened for us. So... It was we were roommates who co-parented, mm-hmm. and so there was no physical or emotional intimacy in the relationship, and that was really it was so it was this quiet, painful secret I had, and I dealt with it by doing CrossFit five or six days mm-hmm. a week and being like lifting 160 pounds over my head on a regular basis and having you know quarter inch long hair and whatever, but. Um, so, when we divorced, um, we, when we divorced, it, there was no acrimony or lawyers, and he's found love, he's remarrying, and he's very happy. But um, when I got together with my boyfriend and connected so intensely to someone emotionally and sexually, it was so good for me. Like it, w- I describe it as like this exfoliation of my whole spirit and it was good for my brain chemistry and my body and my heart and like everything just kind of softened like people who know me for a long time there i'm a different person Mm. than i was three years ago and um and so then i had to go on tour though so we were together for like a week and a half and then i had to go on this three and a half week tour in europe to support the uk and german edition of my last book so I had all this stuff swirling in my head, like going, oh my God, this is amazing. And then I'm like, why did the church make me sign something saying I wouldn't do this? How is it better for my church 
if I'm not getting laid, like that made right. no sense to me. <laughs> like I understand, like you know, don't fuck the flock as a baseline mm-hmm. ethic, you know. <laughs> but but um, I just was puzzling, and my boyfriend's not Christian; he's not part of that tradition. And I texted him. I was like, I gotta talk to you right now. And so, with like really unwarranted urgency, I was like, Why do you think the church has tried to control sex for so long? And without skipping a beat, he goes, I just assume the church saw sex as its competition. And then right. I went, oh, shit, I'm writing a book. <laughs> so, so flesh that personal. out. Like, explain, explain this idea of sex competing with the church. Well, when he said it, it's one of those moments where I didn't know exactly what it meant, but I knew it was true. And so it was almost like my exploration yeah. of why that thing was clearly true. And I think it's that... There's a tran- there can be a transcendence, you know. Sex can 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 have a almost tran- a transcendent quality to it, but also we're seeking to connect deeply to ourselves and to another thing at the same time. And I think that uh, we want, um, yeah, we want transcendence and connection. And that and wholeness. We can, and wholeness, and we can get that through religion and sex. But mm-hmm. both things are sort of, and so I think that because there's such a mystery to it, that I think that it's easier to say no. This is a thing that's dangerous that we have to control and have boundaries in a really particular yeah. way. Well, certainly, uh, there aren't very many institutions that have done more to create the guilt and the shame and these horrible human emotions. Uh, around sex and sexuality that have led to, you know, repression and right. all of the, you know, ill-begotten manifestations of what it's like to live in that space. Right. Right. And, you know, religion is not alone in that regard, but it's certainly mm-hmm. at the top of the yeah. heap in terms right. of right. being... Well, the difference, I mean, obviously the culture gives us really damaging messages and the commodification of sex yeah. and the desirability. Like, you have to have a particular type of body to, for it to be worthy of desire, all that shit. But... That, but the but the culture has never said that those messages are actually from God in the way that the church has. You know, to say the creator of the universe is is saying this message. And one of the things I'm saying on my tour is like, look, shame, like shame has an origin. But in, in the Garden of Eden story, it says that Adam and Eve were naked and and unashamed until they listened to a snake, right? And so. To me, that says shame has an origin, and it's not God. That um, shame doesn't originate from God's voice. Shame originates from voices who say that they are speaking for God, like the snake did, and that's different. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, obviously, there was a time when human beings walked around naked and didn't think twice about it. That's correct. But it's so strange when you think about how we're all hardwired to feel bizarre, if not, you know, self-conscious, if not ashamed mm. to be naked. Like, yeah, what is what right. would be wrong with just, this is how we are naturally sure. you're brought into this world right. to walk down Fifth Avenue completely <laughs> sure, naked. Right. Like, why is that not okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I actually, but it certainly isn't. Yeah. And so, what happened? You know, like deconstructing that, how right. we got to this place. Yeah. And the role that religion has played in fomenting that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, um, it, I think that there's a lot of power to be brokered if you can say that you are speaking for God and, um, and, and saying, like, I'm, I'm God's mouthpiece and, and I'm going to tell you how you should be living and how you should be feeling and where your money should be going, you know? <laughs> I mean, Martin Luther did that, right? I mean, he was... Uh, he had some concerns with some of the fundraising tactics of the Roman Catholic Church, yeah. you know, that were hurting his people. And it's because the church was saying, hey, you can't question us because we're speaking from God. God wants you to do this, right. you know. And it's always this religious camouflage to say, well, it is written or like God wants you, you know, when mm-hmm. really it has to do with brokering power and controlling people. And um, there's a rich history of that in religion. So explain the kind of thesis of the book and how this plays out. So the thesis of the book is that um, 
if the teachings of the church are harming people, we should rethink those teachings. It's pretty basic. Like, we should never be more loyal to an idea or a doctrine or an interpretation of a Bible verse than we are to people. And so, to have the sort and that's, of... And that's the essence of Lutheranism, right? Sure. This is like Martin Luther's whole thing. It's exactly what... I mean, it's not exactly what he did, but I'm, I'm stealing his move. I always do. Uh-huh. I mean... And I also propose an alternate sexual ethic, you know, that's, that's not legalistic or shaming, um, that allows for difference. And, and that is that, uh, uh, stealing a move from Luther again, is that when he wrote the small catechism, he was talking about the Ten Commandments, it, he's like, the Ten Command- fulfilling the commandments are more than just avoiding bad behavior. Like the Fifth Commandment, thou shalt not kill, that should be a freebie. Right, like we uh-huh. most, of, it's like the middle square of the bingo card, right? Like we can all just cross it, yeah. feel good, you know. At least we know we got one, right? You uh-huh. know, and and he's like, hey, 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 not not so fast. That it means we should love and fear God so that we don't harm our neighbor in any way, but we have a concern for their well being and to support their flourishing. So it's not just the absence of harm; it's the presence right. of good. Yeah, actually having to do something as opposed to avoid just just being super awesome at like not doing shit right which is yeah. what a lot of conservative christianity is like it's it's basically um being good at not doing certain things right, right? some of which are are you know human impulses right i mean yeah, sexuality right. certainly being totally first and foremost right. among those like right. just being this machine that's constantly repressing right right Right. Well, that's when that's when religion is is nothing but a reward and punishment program. Mm-hmm. You know, dualistic thinking within religion, it just is basically like you know, God is this angry, capricious bastard who is with a killer surveillance system, who like is giving you reward pellets for good behavior and little shocks for bad behavior. Uh-huh. Um, that is a, that is a foundational uh, view of God that a lot of very conservative Christianity sort of holds. Well, there's few things that can provoke shame on the level of mm. sexuality. Yeah, totally, totally. But those mess. But to sort of dig in and go, where'd that even come from? I spent two years interviewing my parishioners and just saying, like, what message did you receive from the church about sex and the body? And then, how did that message affect you? And how have you navigated your adult life? And I was surprised how many people were just immediately willing to share those stories. People want to get free from this stuff. They really want to get free. And so there was a willingness there that I was shocked by, honestly. Mm. So what are some of the more notable examples of that? Of the stories? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're like, there are, um, uh, you know, young married couples who did everything the church said and waited to have sex till their wedding night. So they're told their whole lives that sex is sort of dangerous and sinful and, you know, you have to keep it at bay. But they found Until they, you get married. they could not flip a right. switch in their brain <laughs> and their bodies sudden. on their wedding night uh-huh. and suddenly go to having sex be joyful and natural and life-giving, right? And really had a lot of struggles because of that. And the church, they sell them this package deal. They're like, if you wait, the sex will be awesome. Right. You know? <laughs> and, um, and but you have no language for it and or, no experience. Or, you're, or no... You're, you're, you're left trying to connect frayed wires suddenly, uh-huh. you know? you. Um, or gay men who never reported the sexual assault they experienced in church, because the church told them being gay was a sin, or women who experienced marital rape when they were 20 years old, and when they told their church, the church, because there's a verse in the Bible that says women are to be subject to their husbands, there's no way it could have been rape. I mean, it's not hard to draw a direct line. Right. So how do we move past all this? Well, there's this thing about just fucking saying the things out loud (laughs) in just a super basic way that is an amazing starting point because um, then when things are brought into the light and into oxygen they have a chance to heal which they never will when they're secret and so light light even just the smallest amount of light can scatter darkness right but darkness has no effect on light and so to be able to just say the things out loud Mm -hmm. um is in itself healing and to hear other people's stories and to go oh my god i'm not the only 
one. Yeah. Just that is healing, you know? This so, is back to AA, too. It is. This I is know. like, I'm telling you, <laughs> right Martin the... Luther and AA. <laughs> I yeah. have nothing to offer the uh-huh. world except for uh, regurgitating yeah. AA and Luther. Uh, you know, <laughs> somebody who wrote a book called Shameless and somebody who's worked very hard to overcome your own issues, mm-hmm. you know, to be shameless yourself. Like, you don't yeah. harbor shame about your past because you've shown a light on it, you know, and I've, yeah. I've undergone a similar process. Um, it's incredibly empowering. And I think when you can then communicate with that level of honesty and vulnerability mm-hmm. what you went through, it gives everybody else permission. Totally. To, there's a sigh of, like, right. relief. Right. And that creates connection and empathy and, and a trajectory all, forward for their own healing. That's all I've ever done. That's my, I'm a one-trick pony. Because what I want, if I'm going to do that, if I'm going to say something like, geez, you know what? Talking about being in a sexless marriage, that's not easy. Yeah. You know? But the only reason I do Especially it... Especially when you're the person that everyone's looking to, to be the wiser one. Right. And so, but there's only one reason to do it. And because when I do it, I've found that it creates a space around me that allows other people to step into this space and feel a little safer to admit what that thing is for them. Uh-huh. And it's a form of leadership I always call, screw it, I'll go first. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Well, it's also sharing your experience. Experience, not telling and people, <laughs> not <laughs> I know. telling people, I'm telling you, you should do this and be this way. <laughs> No, no, I've never done that. Which kind of religion is all about, right? I know. But, you know, in like 10 years of pastoring House for All the Sinners and Saints, I never once told somebody what they should or shouldn't be doing in terms of their sex life. Uh And having a a spiritual community that's based on grace and on just being a beloved child of God and on the fact that, yeah, you're simultaneously sinner and saint, we all fuck up and we can move on because there's grace for all that. When that's the main message, it ends up people make pretty good decisions for themselves without the church having to tell them what those look like. Yeah, I was at the gym this morning and I was listening to an interview with you. I had like earbud, I had an earbud in like one ear and there were three guys and they're working out and they're kind of like, they're very alpha, you know, Mm -hmm. like jacked up dudes. And one guy says, uh, what did he say? I'm going to butcher exactly what he said, but it was something like, I've got a bullet for Nancy Pelosi and like my AR-15 is like on the way. And then some other guy like patted him on the back and said something similar, like affirming that. And this really weird conversation is going on in front of me. And like, I'm a progressive liberal, but like whether you're a conservative Republican or a progressive, like talking about killing the Speaker of the House and like being giddy about that and like your assault rifle. And I was like, I was out of my mind, right? right? And I was like, you're in my earbud and you're talking about grace and like the inconvenience of it. And I'm thinking, I wanted to like intervene in this conversation, which is very, would be, as an introvert, that's not something that would be natural to me. And I was like, how do I, what is the, where's the grace here? Like, yeah, what yeah, am I yeah. supposed to do? Yeah, you know, yeah, I ended up doing yeah. nothing. Yeah, yeah, of course. But I was thinking, yeah. I wonder what Nadia would have done mm-hmm. here or what she would have advised. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing about both like the grace thing and the compassion thing, which are super related, is they are 100% never my first impulse. Ever. So, my first reaction to almost everything is, fuck you. So, uh-huh. I so the almost, anger's still there. Oh, my God. It will never yeah. go away. See, this is where the whole being like Christian perfection or progressive sanctification or enlightenment, I'm like, I don't buy it because... To me, grace for myself and compassion for myself is is that um, I don't get a personality transplant. That my first reaction is always going to be "fuck you," and that's okay, and I can have grace for that. I almost never stay there, but I almost always start there. I just move really quickly to something else now. And so, if I were to judge myself on, oh my god. I can't believe that was my first reaction again. Self-flagellation, mm-hmm. you know, repression, double down on my efforts, wasted, right? It's okay. Like I'm always going to have a little thing about booze, you know. Uh-huh. It's not, but that you get the reprieve, you know, you get a neutrality to it, but it doesn't go away. Yeah. And so, um, same with whatever our defects are that um, I'll always have that as my defect, and it's okay. And it's helped me at certain times in my life. So my first impulse is never, 
how do I extend grace to this person? <laughs> but I often will eventually get there. And it feels so different in my body. My reaction to things and my response to things feel different in my body. So my reaction to that, fuck you, everything's tense, I guard myself, I feel stuff, you know, it feels different. But when I can do the work and go, okay, what would compassion for this person look like? Um, it feels different in my body. Yeah. And the growth or the evolution is in the half-life of the reaction before the more considered response. Yeah. Yeah, right? totally. To totally. know, okay, fuck, the fuck you is going to happen, but that's going to pass quickly and I'm going to get to the more evolved yeah, I'm just, way to I manage don't, this. I, don't, I think it's unrealistic uh-huh. for me to have some expectation that my first reaction to things are, is ever going to change. So that first reaction has so much less power when um, I'm not fighting it and judging it. Mm-hmm. When I have made friends with it and I know it doesn't have to be in the driver's seat. Yeah. I noticed in the book that you really kind of restrict your focus to your own experience and then the experience of your parishioners or these people yeah. that you interview. And you don't get into you know the, the, the scandals of the clergy yep. or anything like that. So it's not oh. a broad referendum mm-hmm. on sexuality in the church in nope. general. It's more about how we can have a healthier relationship, whatever, wherever you find yourself on this mm-hmm. s- sexual spectrum. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, it was important to me to stay in my lane. People are like, well, did you bring up the, the uh, Catholic clergy thing? Or, right. Or what about Islam? I'm like, not my traditions. That's not my story to tell. You know, why would I? I it wouldn't be okay for me to stand above a, a culture or a tradition I'm not a part of and critique it. I can critique something from within my own life mm-hmm. and my own experience, but I just have no interest in going outside that. But boy, I can't wait to read more and more about people within other traditions asking these same questions and hearing what their answers to them are. Well, there's something interesting about the timing also, because we're in a cultural moment right now where there is discussion and dialogue about the diversity of sexuality in a way that I've never experienced sure. you know, yeah. in, in my lifetime. Um, seeing all these new variations yeah. on, on this, right. you know, the duality of male, right. female. Yeah, we have um, like two in a way, flavors. You know, you know I'm, I'm 52, like, like I'm catching up, you yeah, know, trying totally. to like understand Me what's too. going on. Me too. Um, and I find it fascinating. And then, you know, you're writing this book and we're seeing these changes in culture and in religion. Like, why now? Like, why do you think, why is this the moment? Hmm. I don't know, but I did. I did write a piece for the Washington Post last spring about how it feels apocalyptic, because the word apocalypse means revealing, it just means to see what's underneath, you know. And um, it's a big revealing of what's been going on for a long time, mm-hmm. you know. Um, sexual harassment is just a ubiquitous experience in women's lives that we have been socialized to de-escalate and to deal with. And so the fact that we're going, hey, guess what? This has been happening for a long time. We all share this experience. Um, It's just revealing what's already there. And we, we have to keep going. We have to, I mean, we have to dig in and do that work to say, what's just the truth about this, you know? I mean... I haven't had nearly as many horrific experiences as other women in my life. I think I do have the benefit of having like a really sort of dominant personality and also I'm a really large woman. <laughs> so it's a yeah, different you're like six, six one. Six one. Yeah, yeah. about one seventy. So uh I I I have not and CrossFit. I don't do that anymore oh, you for don't? years. No, I only do. Oh, it's so, <laughs> no, it's super embarrassing. Uh-huh. I only do yoga. Like oh, you do? I went What's from being a bad. No, I'm saying I went like, from being like a wellness badass festivals to and softy. doing yoga. I know. Yeah. Talking about compassion and like being in yoga positions, it's super embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's embarrassing. Anyway, I interrupted but, you. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, so the um, but we all have. Uh, but I have uh, all these stories about it too, and that. Women are socialized for our own safety and are um, to 
try and de-escalate situations so that they don't get worse. Mm -hmm. And what that ends up looking like for those who are perpetrators is it looks like we don't mind. And it's not that we don't mind, it's that we're trying to survive. And so um, I, I'm... I'm all, I'm here for this. I mean, I'm here for it. I understand there's there there are some some negative aspects to this moment, but for the most part, I think there are a lot of people who are who uh, who have second thoughts before they do before they sexually harass someone, mm-hmm. you know, before they step over that line, and uh, because they're actually for the first time are like um, repercussions, right? Right. Well, certainly that's happening. Yeah. You know, I think that it's been successful in that regard, and I think it's only going to continue. And it is, it is, it's about time. Mm-hmm. It's long overdue. It is. Especially when, you know, you get to, like in looking at your book and kind of diving deeper into your work, to see how deeply rooted these these unhealthy traditions are, like how far back they go, and how, like, entrenched they are. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. much so that it can delude you know an otherwise intelligent person into you know ascribing to these traditions just because that's the way it's always been well it it runs deep i mean when you're given messages in god's name those those go down to a yeah. our created place so yeah. how is this book being received by the traditional religious community is I, it considered controversial, or is it I, being embraced, or I mean, I it just came out? I wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. You, you don't. You don't pay attention to that. Good for no, you. No, I mean, I have a thing where I mean, I'm seeing. I know that there are people who have read this book this week and have gone to these book events who are saying, "Oh my gosh, thank you." It's time. I've never felt seen in a church before. I've, you know, someone's speaking about my experience. I'm here for the Reformation. It's healing. I cried the whole time. So, the people for whom, because that question I ask before I speak, what's the most pastoral thing I can say to someone? That book is a pastoral book. And so, the fact that people are feeling well pastored by that book in terms of their own stuff around sex and religion, then the what i was hoping people would experience when they read it they are experiencing so to me it's a success right <laughs> but then they don't have a church of all sinners and saints that they can go to on sunday well neither they have do, their organization neither do I. yeah i guess I mean, you don't i'm either. not allowed to go uh-huh. like it's a thing in my denomination you you don't get to go back may, until at least a year and so i started the church i felt the most comfortable being in and like i am also in a place where i'm like Where's my Nadia Boltzweber? Where's somebody starting a church, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, doing all that work so I can show up, you know? So I'm I'm with everyone in the like I don't have a place to go, but um, so I don't I don't know what what to do about that because I I can't start another one. That one almost killed me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but in terms of re- reaction, I do I do know that um, both. I, I try and have clarity about the fact that both my, for lack of a better word, like my fans and my critics, these are both like passionate groups of people who are equally distant from the truth. So the people who are, are my fans are just as <laughs> just as far from the actual truth of who I am mm-hmm. as my critics are. And neither groups are very reliable sources of information about right. myself to myself. Yeah, if you if you read all, you know, everything that your fans say and you choose to believe that, then you have to choose to also believe all the bad things. That's that right. Other people are and, saying about you. And you know what? Most of the time both the praise and the criticism of other people is more about them than me. Of course, it even the is. praise is. Yeah. You know, so. So now that you've stepped out and you don't have this affiliation with the organization anymore, how do you navigate like the ego pitfalls of like being this you know sort of um, you know public intellectual at large mm-hmm. who's speaking about these issues that are that are very heightened and emotional for a yeah. lot of people. Like, you become this brand almost, yeah. right? And there's a lot of trepidation, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, that mm-hmm. comes with that. Yeah. Well, the antidote for me personally is that my private life is very small and super boring. 
Uh-huh. <laughs> like, I don't, it's just my, I spend my time alone or with my boyfriend and sometimes with one of my kids if they're around. And, um, you know, I've been doing this volunteer work in the women's prison when I can. And I oh, go to cool. my AA group and I have a sponsee and uh-huh. uh, I just, you know, spend time cooking. And I like, there's nothing, there's nothing super cool or interesting about my private life. It's small and simple. Yeah. And then the public stuff, I do the public stuff, and I'm glad I get to do this. Like, I, I'm glad that I'm, like, a person for a living. Like, you're a person for a living. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? like, yeah, it's weird. Yeah, it's awesome if you can get it, you uh-huh. know. But, um, but then I just have this clarity about most of my life is my private life, and that's, like, not even interesting at all. Yeah. I do go to my yoga class. I just started a book club in my yoga studio because I just didn't know who these people were and I don't have a church. So I'm uh-huh. like, I'm actually really lonely right now. I have a beautiful, Aww. I'm still with Eric and I have this gorgeous relationship, but Your I don't, daughter's have, in college, I don't right? have a community. Yeah. She's in college. Uh-huh. So, uh, like I was like, anybody want to just do a so book So you can't club? even go to your own church and like sit no, and, <laughs> I'd do anything to go. I'm desperate to go. It's well, so unfair. You, that's weird. That that's needs just, a reformation. Yeah. Why can't you just show no, no, up? No, I think it's right. They need yeah. to be them without me for a, a while. Uh-huh. You know? They have to wean themselves off the Nadia yeah, I mean, energy. Just, it just, they're doing it on their own, and it's beautiful, right. and they're making different kinds of choices, maybe, uh-huh. um, and feeling free. And like they're doing great, and I don't want to mess that up. And I wouldn't, anyway. I wouldn't get involved. Literally, I just want to be able to show up to worship every once in a while. Well, what is, what's Jason Flom doing with the Church of Rock and Roll? Like, <laughs> I'm confused. Well, I, I don't know. I'm not sure what it is yet, but he well, just posted on Instagram the other day, like, things are happening, something's but, going on. Like, I, I, I wasn't sure what that like, meant. I but. think it's going to be, um, like, in a couple physical locations yeah, and it's going to be a vegan be a restaurant place. and a venue uh-huh. and um, I'm, pu- I'm like projecting that you're involved in that <laughs> no, are you or are I, you no, not okay so I met him at the Nantucket Project and I preached that sermon to the limousine liberals and the atheist Jews and then he uh, came up he goes I'm opening a church this weekend in Vegas yeah. and it's a pop-up thing and I'm like who is this guy and what is he talking right. about and then he goes, can I fly you out? Would you give us a blessing for the opening? And I, I looked into what it was. I mean, we talked for actually seven hours that day. Wow. And, um, and I said, yeah, because I liked what it was about. And um, if somebody wants me to show up as a clergy person and give them a blessing, it's that's my work to do. Mm-hmm. And so um, in the morning, I had to do a keynote address at the National Verger Convention at the Cathedral in Denver. So, vergers are the lay people who look maybe a little bit like they're on the faculty of Hogwarts, and they have a stick, and they and they lead the they're the they're the ushers for the clergy and stuff, right? So uh-huh. they they lead the procession with the stick, a verge, right. into the cathedral, <laughs> and they boss all the clergy around, tell them where to sit, which they need that because we're uh-huh. an undisciplined bunch, right? Okay, so it was the National Verger Convention. So the bishop, the Episcopal Bishop of Colorado, is introducing me, and I'm in the cathedral and I'm addressing the vergers and I go from there to DIA and fly into Las Vegas and meet Jason Flom and uh-huh. at the Life is Beautiful Festival they did a right. pop-up of the Church of Rock and Roll and um, Greta Van Fleet played right. in this tiny venue, maybe 120 people, half of whom were deaf or hard of hearing. All of us uh, were equipped with these vests that... Um, that on like our, haptic. Yeah, and yeah. so on our ankles... And our wrists, and we had these vests, and it was hooked into the sound system, and it vibrated with the music. And so, the hearing, the hard of hearing, the deaf, the hearing people were sharing an experience mm. at a concert, mm-hmm. whether you could hear or not. That's it was cool. profound. Like that's inclusion, you know. And um, and Greta Van Fleet was playing for like 120 people, and I give this blessing. And um, yeah, it was great. So I think he's trying to. Get, he's getting uh, funders and going to have like actual locations that are venues and vegan restaurants, and mm-hmm. it sounds fun. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it's not like a church. Well, to Jason, Maybe. it's a church. Right? Okay. Well, it's a church of rock <laughs> well, yeah, and roll, yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Right. And and they have these things that they're about, like like you know all of this stuff that they believe. That it's like you know, be optimistic and be welcoming and be brave and, you know, all of this stuff. And I was like, hey, I believe in those things, and so I'll bless this thing. It was fun. Yeah, it'll be cool to see what he does with that. Yeah, I agree. He's Mm. a a good guy. I mean, he's been, what, he's been on the board of directors of the Innocence Project for 25 years. Like, that guy is... Yeah, he's done a lot. He's done a lot. 
It's um, crazy. He's, I mean, he's uber successful in the music business. Oh, he's a but, legend. But his, his you know, passion. his work yeah. with um, the wrongly accused is kind oh, of amazing. It's inspiring. Yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. So, what is it that you want people to take from Shameless? Like, who's it for? Um, it's for anyone who's felt ashamed of their sexual nature because of something someone told them in God's name. You know, it's for anyone who's had to keep their love life secret. It's mm-hmm. for anyone who um, hasn't fully connected to their own erotic response systems because of religion, you know, who who have not experienced flourishing or who have a gay son and they're like outsiders in their church now because they support their kid who's awesome. You know, all, I mean, there's so many people out there have been damaged by the church's teachings around that stuff. I actually say in the book, like, look, man, if you look around your life and your church and you only see like cisgender, heterosexual, straight couples who married their one true love and never masturbate or look at porn and have only had sex with their partner and it's still really good and they've had nice Christian children. And like, so like the church's teachings has, have only caused flourishing and people are actually glowing with the satisfaction of living in, quote, God's special plan for humanity. Like, if that's all you see in your life and no one's been hurt by any of this shit, this book is not for you. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, the, I'm the, sure those people this exist. For but everyone I don't, yeah. else. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you use that example of the crop circles, right? The, right, the circular right, right, fields right. when you're flying in an yeah. airplane, and you're like, why are these round and yeah. not square? And right. it's not that they're, it's not that they're round. It's just that the irrigation goes in a circle, mm-hmm. um, and what's outside of that circle doesn't get fed yeah. and dies. The and crops those are the people watered. that don't fall into They're that. They're planted in circles yeah. that's watered in circles. Right. And so the the water doesn't get, the center pivot irrigation system doesn't allow water to get to the edges. And I'm like, God planted a lot of us in the corners. And the center pivot irrigation of the church's teachings around sex and bodies and gender doesn't include us. But there's the church and then there's the teachings and the text. And what's counterintuitive about what you're saying in the book is that the answers that you seek or the reformation that you're advocating mm-hmm. can be found in returning to the text. Right. Right? Yeah. Which is not what you expect. Yep. You expect like a big fuck you and nope. we're going to do our own thing. Yeah, but you know, a lot of times um, the source of the harm can be the most potent place for its healing, you know? So... I think going back to the text is the most powerful move you can make. Yeah. It's got to be really painful for a lot of people, though, just to even gather the courage or the mm-hmm. gumption to even face this. Yeah. This, These the, events, know, the past, you know, I've done five uh, this week, and um, there have been, you know, 500 to 800 people in each one. And um, Are they in churches? Yeah, it's in churches. Mm-hmm. And... I talk about why I wrote it, and I always have another voice, somebody who is uh, mostly people, women of color who have a different social location to talk about their experience as well. And, um, but we have these cards that say, you know, I'm ready to be shameless about dot, 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 and people have been filling them in, and mm. they're so powerful. I mean, everything from I'm ready to be shameless about like my aging body or I'm ready to be shameless about how much weight I gained after I was raped. Or I mean, they're intense. And you read them out loud, like I, they like that thing at Nantucket Project where they were reading. That's the, exactly oh, where I got uh-huh. that. That's where yeah, I got yeah, the yeah. idea, and um, I read them out. And then somebody was like, "I'm ready to be shameless about having really great sex after my 79th birthday." <laughs> I was like, <laughs> "You go, girl." Hashtag life goals. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. But um, so then people feel left less alone. I want them to feel less alone, and then. I wrote this benediction that I give at the end, and then I we just blast Prince's kiss, and I invite everyone to dance, and they do. You can tell mm. that they want to move, like they want to express the freedom that they're starting to feel, and it's been powerful. That's cool. Mm-hmm. How many more cities do you have to go? All of them. No. All of them? <laughs> no. Are you I just think, fully um, on the road? Yeah, no. I, I go home for a couple of days, and then I think I have... Uh, like seven or eight more cities. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, let's close it down with one with a word last of prayer. Question. Yeah, <laughs> so actually, no, that'd be good. I am going to make you do that. What am I doing? You're here to take advantage of that. 
<laughs> no, I wanted to say, I wanted, I wanted to like address or have you say something to the person who's listening, mm-hmm. who, who doesn't have a connection with faith, or perhaps mm-hmm. like lost mm-hmm. their connection with faith in whatever mm-hmm. tradition mm-hmm. they find themselves in. Mm-hmm. Like, <clears throat> what is it about faith and connection that? Um, that you find to be so important as part of the human condition, and how can that person find their way back to a place of of incorporating that into their life? Well, it, in a way, it's not like a super popular sentiment, but um, I just I don't feel like I'm enough in in a sense that I do think having a power that's more than just me and accessing that is um, has transformed my life and that that's possible and available for anyone regardless of what they believe or what sort of you know faith they have that that there are things that accessing like having a connection to our source and to the divine allows us to undergo a certain type of healing and transformation that would be very difficult for us to do just as our own on our own as individuals Mm -hmm. so that's the power of it to me and um and there are things like people who were raised religious and had to leave sometimes there are still like hymns that are dear to them or prayers their grandmother said or whatever and i think just finding those things and integrating them back into our lives on our own terms can be really healing Mm. and um it's like this spiritual reclamation project and um and it's okay to do that it's who you are and it's fine because your symbol system forms you in a way that's hard to escape so making friends with it on your own terms as an adult can be um yeah it can be healing when you said the word hymns i had a like a almost like a visceral physical <laughs> negative reaction to that no, like really? every yeah like hymns. everything <laughs> all the trappings uh, around uh. everything churchy yeah just repels me interesting i love hymns but and I, only if they're i don't acapella. it's not like anything happened to me either yeah, right like, it's not like you have some trauma no no it. it's yeah, just yeah. like i'm like mm. Ugh. Mm-hmm. but uh, i'm sure i'm not alone was it was it way. um was it a, a huge part of your upbringing or was no it, yeah, not see, huge i mean it was just all i knew yeah it yeah. wasn't like front and center like you. It was like, you know, yeah. we went to I went to Sunday school and we would go to church on Sunday and then it was just on, you know, kind of occasionally and then it was holidays. But yeah. what's interesting is my huh. parents have found their way back to oh. the church. There's huh. a church across the street from them where they live in Washington DC and that's huh. become really a, a super yeah. important part yeah, of their yeah, yeah. Huh. life um and that was not the case when we were oh, growing interesting. up. interesting. Well, it's all but, I knew, and and um, I just never even even when I wasn't part of it, I didn't, I could never pull off being an atheist, you know. And uh, did um, you try? You were trying that. Well, no, I just admired it. I think, <laughs> and, um, and others. And uh, there's this guy Frank Schaefer who said this thing. Francis Schaefer, a famous evangelical, is his father. But Frank said in an interview, I think with Terry Gross, she was asking, you know, like, well, you're after all that, like, you you still are part of a church, aren't you? And he goes, yeah, I am. And, he, and she goes, why? And he goes, look, all I know is that, like, if what I wanted more than anything in the world was to be an atheist, all I'd know to do was to just pray to God to make me one. <laughs> <laughs> and that's me. Yeah. Like, I just... I, That's like I can't not be this thing on some level. If I know? wasn't an alcoholic, I'd drink every, every day. Every day, exactly. You know, it's like the same, like circular <laughs> exactly. reasoning. Right? That's exactly right. Yeah, very, very good. Cool. Well, delightful to talk to you. Yeah, good to talk really to you. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, best of luck with the book. Um, I'm about like I think 85 pages into it, so yeah. I still have a ways to go, but I'm yeah. really enjoying it. Thanks. And it's important work that you're doing. You know, you're really exposing people and and and. Um, opening them up to ideas around faith and religion that uh, I think um, most people haven't been exposed to, myself included. So, Well, also, I just I want people to have better sex. You do? Well, <laughs> it's do. as simple as that. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's a pastoral concern <laughs> uh-huh. of mine that, like, I want you to be having, like, good sex, man. And not feel bad about yourself. Oh, my God, absolutely. It. No, not feel bad about yourself. Yeah. yeah. Shame and sex, man.
That's a tough one. My publisher, when I said I'm going to write this, he goes, did you literally scan the horizon for the biggest giant? And you're like, well, I'll take that one down. Right. (laughs) Definitely. There's definitely a a gorilla in the room to tackle with this one. So um, it's cool. It's awesome. Uh, I love everything you're doing. Super uh, glad to have had this time with you. So thank you. Um, If people want to uh, come and hear you speak. Is that these are open to the public, right? Yeah, these there's events? only a couple cities that have tickets mm. left. It's mostly sold yeah. out, but I think maybe oh, New York City for sure. There's still tickets for New York. But if you go to Nadia Bowles Weber, there's a, there's dot com. A, <laughs> you have a schedule up there, right? I would imagine. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And mm-hmm. at sarcastic Lutheran on Twitter, and at Instagram. Luther, Luther, uh, yeah, okay. at sarcastic Luther. Luther, okay, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, you're pretty easy to find. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks. Peace. Yep. Oh wait, you're gonna do a prayer. No, no, I'm good. You are? Yeah, I just I Did super you just had deny to go to the me? bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, later. Is Peace. there one to hear? Right around the corner. Okay.